Well, the title of the message this morning is A Chance for Deliverance. A Chance for Deliverance. And um, if you would turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 3, what I'd like for you to imagine doing this morning is going on this journey with Peter and John and what they were confronted with. And just think for a moment how we might respond as we see how they responded uh, in a situation like this. Fortunately, most of us have never had to uh, be involved in, a, in, in this type of situation, uh, but you never know when it can happen. Before we be begin, as, you turn, as you're turning to Acts chapter 3, uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for um, this opportunity to be here today. And uh, Lord, how we uh, uh, just love being uh, with your people and, and uh, Father, together, all of us, to share in your word and to, to sing to, praises to your name. And, and Lord, um, uh, what a tremendous joy it is in uh, the, the world that, that's around us that is crumbling and falling apart. And uh, we have each other and um, we, we, we have the... Uh, the opportunity to come to a place of peace and uh, and a place that that you're you're present with us and Lord we just uh, thank you for uh, your word and we just pray as we delve into it into it today that you would anoint it to our thoughts and our uh, convictions and uh, everything else Father and uh, and uh, help us to enter in with Peter and John we just commit it all to you in Jesus name Amen. All right, Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Most of you, I think, are probably familiar with this story. But as, as I said uh, already, we, we want to try to enter in to Peter and John's experience. Uh, Peter, this is uh, right shortly after Pentecost, and uh, Peter and John have teamed up together. The Lord has put them together for a pretty good spell here. Uh, this is long before Paul came on the scene, and um, uh, Peter and John were quite involved in, in the early going here, as many, many people were saved. Verse 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and as that would be three in the afternoon, and a certain man, came, uh, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. So they would carry this man. He was so lame and so unable to navigate for himself that they would carry him there. And every day. So th that was a ministry for somebody. I mean, picture that in our church. I mean, that was a ministry uh, for someone there. And... Uh, so they would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, and he would ask alms as people uh, came and went from the temple. Uh, verse 3, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Uh, they, had, they had sat him down, they had laid him there, and here comes Peter and John, and, and this man asked them for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So Peter wanted to get his attention. So he gave them his, his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He thought Peter was going to dig into a, the pocket of his robe and, and pull out some, some, a, a couple of denarii or some other loose change to give to him. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Can you imagine the anticipation on the part of this man? He's expecting some money, because that's what everybody else probably did, that, passed, passed, uh, that went past him into the temple. But Peter says, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I give you. And now he's in an expectant mode now. Um... And then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand 
and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. Now keep in mind, he's been in this condition since birth. And, but there's something about when Peter reached and, to help him up, that the strength went to his ankles and his legs, his feet. And he sensed that. This man sensed that and just responded. His body just responded and he leaped up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Verse 8, so he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. He didn't need how to, le to learn how to walk, even though he's been in this condition since birth. And, and that's the nature of, of a miracle from God. Uh, that's the way it works. And... Um, and so here he is, leaping and walking and praising God. Verse 9, and, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Now that's an important element. Because they know, they've been, they, they pass him every time. Every Sabbath. They pass him sitting there asking alms. And now all of a sudden they see this miracle. All of them. And... He's walking and praising God. Verse 10, Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I mean, you've entered in now, I hope, to this, right? And this has occurred right here in this church, let's say. Let's say this is the temple. And would you not be filled with wonder and amazement knowing that this man was in this condition from birth? I certainly would. And um, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, as the lame man who was healed had held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So there is a physical response now to what has happened here, to this miracle. And these people have, uh, they've ran together to them in the porch, Peter, John, and uh, this man. Just, just greatly amazed. Now, at that point, Peter preaches the gospel to those people. Because you remember, this is the temple, and these are predominantly Jewish people, and um, they may have never heard the gospel. This is very early on in the beginnings of the church age. So Peter preaches the gospel to them. And um, we're going to go through that later on. But I'd like you to move over now to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, we spoke, I spoke a moment of, uh, ago during uh, uh, announcement time about confronting people and being out there, you, and you never know what situation the Lord is going to put you in. And I want you to imagine that you're Peter and John, and the, the Sadducees are the, the, the priests, that's the Pharisees, and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees approach. They come, come upon them. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So you can see their, the fact that they're disturbed. They're approaching you and you can see it in their eyes. Can you see it in, you, in this situation? Uh-oh, you know, here they come, and I don't know if they expected this, possibly, or, but there was no, there's no indication in the text that uh, they were forewarned about this. So this is what's called really walking with God here, really trusting in the, the Holy Spirit in a situation. And as Peter and John, as you'll see, they were ready, we have to be ready as well. 
Verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, uh, these, are, these, the, the, these priests and the Sadducees, no doubt many of them were present, or certainly they had heard about Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, they stood there and they observed Lazarus coming out of the tomb, the grave cloths falling off, and they observed, in that case also, a, a remarkable miracle. But then, what did they do after Jesus had raised him from the dead? They sought to kill Lazarus, because they didn't want the word getting out as to what had happened. And just, just as this man's healing was something they wanted to hush up, they didn't want Lazarus, the example of Jesus raising Lazarus, to uh, stir people and, and take, move them away from uh, these priests who, up till now, had been the authority with all the people. Now, can you imagine this? <clears throat> Their thinking was so demented that... They sought to kill Lazarus. Now, if they actually were to accomplish that, would they not think, well, he could just do it again? Jesus could just raise him again. And if you kill him again, he can just raise him again. And what kind of a game are you, are you thinking of playing here? I mean, it's just, going to, it's just going to accentuate the miracle to more people. So there's a, it's a no-win situation. Uh, for these priests whatsoever so verse 3 here says and they laid hands on, on them on Peter and John and put them in custody until the next day they put them in jail can you imagine uh, here you are and God has just allowed you to uh, to perform this incredible miracle on this fellow and uh, all of a sudden you're being thrown in jail So they laid hands on them, put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number, number of the men came to be about 5,000. I mean, this is an incredible uh, uh, miracle uh, performed under oppressive opposition. By these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, who had been outclassed, upstaged, didn't—they didn't know what to think or how to respond to this. Except they didn't like it. They didn't like it. They were so far from God in their religious fanaticism, and that's all it was for them. They're, they were just religious people uh, trying to keep the law, and. Um, and uh, lead all the people, being, being the big shots among the people with their flowing robes and their phylacteries that they had around their wrist with all their, little, their prayers inside, that little box with the prayers inside. And uh, uh, they had a lot of pride attached to that. So now it's not just that Peter and John have been f the facilitators in raising this man to health again that was asking alms at the temple. But now, as a result, and, and Peter preached the gospel, and as a result of this, 5,000 people are saved. Now, what is the Sanhedrin going to do about this? How are they going to deal with this? So now we're going to have a a, a, a conflab about this. We're going to have a discussion. Ber verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst... They asked, by what power? So they set Peter and John in their midst. And they're going to grill them now. How would you and I react to this? 
what would we be thinking? And they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And how would we respond? Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Uh, did Peter back off and sweet coat this? Not a chance. I mean, this did Peter have opportunity to, re to rehearse this before uh, he, had to be, he was confronted? Not in any way, shape, or form. What's the key here in verse 8? Filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just took over. You know, Scripture tells us, Jesus told us, it, 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 when, when the end times come and things are really rough, to not even think what we're going to say, because he'll put the words in our mouth. Right? So that's what's happened here. And, uh, but Peter, of course, nonetheless, like we are, uh, is well versed in the word of God. So he knows where he's heading here, but the Holy Spirit just took over and uh, fine-tuned this. And, uh, and the boldness that he had comes forth here in the fact that um, uh, he accuses them. He accuses them. So he says, verse 10 again, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. See, he didn't back off on that part, did he? With them standing there. Whom God raised from the dead, and by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, they don't know, these priests and Sadducees may have never heard the gospel, and they, they might not even know that they need to be saved, or what's involved, what do you mean saved? Um, so th that's a, th but that's, I, I think they got the idea, but they need more information. And uh, along the way, I'm sure they got it. And I'm sure, I'm sure they recognized it, but they didn't like it. So they, they, they probably, I'm certain they had heard of, of Jesus' ministry and, and uh, these people as well, and Peter and John and the other apostles. Uh, so they have a basic idea for certain. So here's their reaction, beginning in verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. These Pharisees and Sadducees marveled over what they had heard that Peter had just uh, recited to them and challenged them and, and, and uh, told them their part in this whole thing, in the crucifixion of Jesus. And they perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, and they marveled at all of this. So they hadn't been to the priest school, Peter and John, or whatever education these priests and Sadducees, these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees had, uh, they hadn't been there. And they come out of nowhere, and uh, they know what they're talking about. And they're ready. The Lord has made them ready. So they marveled that they were uneducated and untrained men, no priest training, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. 
Now, we might be encouraged when we saw this happening to them, realizing that you and I had been, have been with Jesus. And we might be encouraged about that fact, and we might be wondering if salvation might be on the doorstep to these people. And they realized that they had been with Jesus, verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. I'm sure they wanted to, but they don't have anything to say in this situation. Now, what's really neat and what I'm sure Peter and John have, had picked up on is the, the Lord orchestrating this whole thing, putting this whole thing together. They could say nothing against it. Verse 15, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they told Peter and John, you wait outside. Now, we got to talk. We got to have a conversation. So Peter and John went outside. And they said, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. We can't deny it. It's all happened. And all these people have witnessed it. What are we going to do to these men? Why would they want to do anything to those men, having realized what had happened, these priests? They saw it all. They heard it all. They knew it all. And here they were confronted with it. And they wanted to do something to these men. And they admit that a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident, they said, to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We can't deny it. Um, if you were them, would you throw up your hands and turn around and walk away and go home? Because they've admitted everything, that it's, that it's all, this is all real and good. And On the other hand, amazing blindness does amazing things. Verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people. They're, they're talking together. They're having this conversation. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. How is that going to fly? Do you think Peter and John are going to say okay and walk away? <laughs> Not a chance. They've come too far, haven't they? Come too far. And they're, they're bold. Not brash. We don't want to be brash. But the, the, these Pharisees and Sadducees knew that they had been confronted by a couple of men who knew what they were talking about and who had conviction, conviction of what they were saying. Amazing blindness to them. But so, verse 17 again, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. They're going to gain favor. They think they're going to gain favor with God about this. They think they're playing on the right side of the team. On the right side of the football field. Verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, that didn't stop them, they threatened them some more. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them. Well, there had to be many means by which they could punish them. But what's the reason they didn't? Because of the people. Since they all glorified God for what had been done. The people were glorified. 5,000 had responded to, to Peter's gospel message. 
and they're just elated and uh, amazed and, and thankful and grateful to God for what had been done in their lives. 5,000 of them. And um, so uh, now the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are afraid of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done. Verse 22, For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. He was over 40 years old in that 40 years in that condition from birth. And he's suddenly healed and he's whole and he's well. And now 5,000 people have been saved. What a remarkable thing. Could you or I envision ourselves ever getting in, in the midst of a situation like this? Unrehearsed but not unprepared. Amen? Not unprepared because over the years what we have been taught by the Holy Spirit from the Word of God is going to would, would, would kick in as it did with Peter and John. Hardness of hearts is what they, Peter and John, and we are constantly running into. Hardness of hearts. But we have to remember, we were there once. Remember that? Before Christ came into our lives, before we came to understand our sin and our need of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we need to keep on keeping on in the faith, just as Peter and John did. All right, discouragement can set in. But with Peter and John, their boldness just overcame that. All right, I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 10, as Jesus himself encounters a man and is going to deal with him concerning salvation. Okay, Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 17. Now as he, Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This is in stark contrast to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, isn't it? They didn't want to know anything about it. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And in Matthew's Gospel, it also includes, and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's everything. Verse 20, and he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. You think? Maybe a little wishful thinking added in there. Verse 21, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, that, boy, how important that is, isn't it? That we show love to them. Even if we were verbally abused to the extent that Peter and John were, in their situation, the love of God was certainly coming through. So Jesus, verse 21, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now this is the rich young ruler, and he, he has a lot of wealth. Verse 22, and because of that, verse 22, But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. You know, it's not just money. In this case, it was money. This man was rich. But what is it that uh, you and I were... Uh, 
possessive of before we came to Christ. It's always something that we're possessive of in this life that we don't want to give up. So he went away sorrowful. Verse 23, Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And might I add how hard it is for those who have anything of this life that has got a grip on them, that's important to them, to give it up. Verse 24, And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for the uh, camel to go through the eye of a needle than for these Pharisees and Sadducees to admit their sin and to yield to Peter's gospel and what he preached from the word of God by the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, when they heard this in verse 25, when Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, I mean, picture that. I know you have in the past with this passage. Just picture it. And that's why verse 26 says, and they were greatly astonished, saying among, the, among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. We know that, we, that when we go out there, and if we have the opportunity to share the gospel with, with someone, that we, God is with us. His Holy Spirit is orchestrating everything that needs it. Do you ever get frustrated at times? Uh, in an opportunity to share the gospel with someone and you're right in the middle of it and you're about to, you're, you're so excited, you're right, right about to close in on the last two or three verses that this is going to do it. And say you're in an office with them or somewhere else or out walking or whatever and the phone rings and they're fumbling in their pocket for the cell phone and it's somebody, a call they've got to take and the, the, the conversation is over with. Every, frustrating, isn't it? But guess what? God had you say exactly what he wanted you to say. You can be confident of that. Amen? And someone else may, he may use someone else later on, or whatever it might be, or what you said may be enough. It may be just enough. But with men it is impossible, but not with God. For God, with God all things are possible. So God is willing, but are we? Those of us uh, in our lost state, when we were in our lost state, I want you to think back at, on those days. God was willing, but were we? And eventually we had to be willing as well as he worked in our heart and in our lives. <clears throat> Here's what Isaiah had to say about it. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. I'd like to read to you a, a, a track in closing that... Um, we picked up at the uh, Civil War reenactment a few years ago up at Tinker Nature Park. And uh, this track was used by, it was developed during the Civil War by the soldiers who knew the Lord. And they would pass them out to other soldiers uh, on either side of the battlefield as, as they were able. And I'd like to read this to you. It's a, to me, it's, it's a, an excellent uh, salvation message with the right, just the right verses in it and uh, just the right things uh, that they had to say. Um, uh, wish there were a way to know who actually wrote this. It's entitled, Religion or Salvation? Which have you? The Pharisees, these Pharisees and Sadducees had a lot of religion, but no salvation. 
And that's true today, isn't it? People all over have a religion. I mean, we could go down the list and name a lot of them, but no salvation. So religion or salvation, which have you? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Nor is there salvation, this came from our text, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, 12. So clear and concise. How can there be confusion or contradiction? There are many names under heaven in which we can find religion, but salvation can be found in only one. But why is personal salvation needed? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. So all need a Savior. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. But why him? Why Jesus? Because God, seeing our hopeless condition, came to earth in the body of a man, then took our sin upon himself and paid our penalty by putting, to death, putting it to death on Calvary's cross. For he, that's God, had made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our sacrifice, our substitute, because we deserve that death. Amen? Amen? But Jesus took it for us in our place in order to set us free. So God had made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 So his death there was not to give men a religion. It was to provide salvation there is no salvation in pastors or priests, penance or prayers, but only in Christ. Service and sacraments, mosque, church, or synagogue, works, ritual, and reformation, all are alike helpless to save. Many are willing to give mental assent to the claims of Christianity while refusing to commit their heart and soul to the Christ of Christianity. Many are willing to take the high place in the work and ritual of religion while refusing to take the low place of sinners in need of a Savior. But to those who recognize their flawed condition and in sincere repentance earnestly seek the Savior's touch, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, religion is an attempt to improve our old nature through respect for lofty principles. Salvation, on the other hand, is the imparting of a new nature by receiving the lowly Christ. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. John 1.12 But how does one go about receiving Jesus? And Paul gives us the answer in Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God had ra has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Please notice that what is offered in this text is salvation, not religion. And to those who cry out to him in this fashion with a truly believing heart, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Religion sets up rituals through which we are to work on becoming righteous. Salvation, on the other hand, is the act of Jesus graciously imputing his righteousness to us when we request the merciful saving grace that only he can impart. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us. Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Put another way, religion says we must be found striving for perfection in order that we might become good enough to gain God's acceptance. 
On the other hand, salvation says we must be found in him, not having our own righteousness, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard this morning. And uh, just simply by an uplift hand, lifted hand, if you happen to be here this morning and you are struggling in your need for Jesus to help you with something, or certainly if you are struggling in your need to come to salvation, would you just lift your hand? I'll not point you out, not embarrass you, but just with up, upraised hand I, that I can pray for you. Anyone at all? Okay. It's hard. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, we need to be we need to be ready in season and out of season, right? But that's <laughs> sometimes that's hard. Yeah. It's uh Yes. The other cochlear implant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eligible for it? Yeah. Yeah. That would be that that would really be wonderful, Jan. Would be. Really be wonderful. Yep. Yeah. All right. Any anyone else before we close? All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the boldness of Peter and John. Father, we just pray you'd help us uh, individually to have that boldness and to be ready to speak. And, uh, Father, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in, in our time of need if we ever in, have an encounter, anything like uh, they did. And, Lord, uh, uh, we just uh, uh, pray for Jim and the uh, possibility of this cochlear implant. And, Father, we just pray that you might, uh, this might be a benefit for him. And uh, Lord, just uh, thank you for uh, the blessing of your word and uh, for salvation that is so freely offered. In Jesus' name, amen.